Hi, my name is Anna and I'm here to tell you about my experiences working with a group called the International Women's Peace Service, which is based in the West Bank and basically we do two things. First of all, we're there to document human rights abuses in the region and second of all, we're there to support non-violent resistance to the occupation. And I'll be telling you more about what this occupation looks like in the presentation, but before I do so, just a little bit about myself. I'm a Jewish American, and I originally got into this work when I was living in Turkey, and I would take trips through the Middle East during my vacations. I was in Iran, in Syria, and Lebanon, and along my way I was taken in by families, many of them Palestinian refugees, and through my friendships with these people that I met along the way, I began to hear for the first time a whole different sort of version of the history and present of Israel and Palestine, utterly different from anything that I'd ever learned growing up as a Jewish American. And I was very disturbed, alarmed by what I heard. I didn't believe it. I thought it was all propaganda. But it sort of planted a seed, and I began to do some of my own research and eventually decided to go to Palestine to see with my own eyes what was happening. And that's when I took my first trip to Palestine. And that's what I'd like to tell you about is what I found when I got there. Um, I'm not here to give sort of a, a sweeping analysis of the entire history of the conflict. I'm not here to give every single perspective on the issue. I'm here to give my perspective as a Jewish American who spent five months working in the West Bank. Now when I first got to Palestine there were of course many sort of surprises along the way but one of the first ones was just aesthetically the way Palestine looked. I guess I'd imagined the Middle East to be sort of rolling sand dunes, barren desert land and when I got there I realized that Palestine was actually very beautiful. This is a picture showing Palestine in the springtime. You can see how fertile and green the land is. But beyond showing how beautiful it is, I actually think that this photograph captures what I have come to believe is really at the heart of the Israel-Palestine conflict. A lot of people have sort of a, a perception of this issue as being kind of an, an age-old rivalry between Jews and Muslims, something that's been going on for thousands of years and will continue for thousands more because at its heart are these sort of deep religious differences. And one of the first realizations that I came to when I got to Palestine was that for the most part, this really is not a war about religion. This is a war about land, about water, about resources. And I hope that my reasons for coming to those conclusions will be clear in this presentation. Now to get you oriented, here's a map of the Middle East. Israel and Palestine are located in the Middle East. That tiny little purple and white sliver there, here's a larger version of that map. And the beige areas in this map indicate the de facto internationally recognized borders of the State of Israel. Meanwhile, the pink areas on the right and left are the two land masses making up the Palestinian territories occupied in 1967. And they are on the left, the Gaza Strip, and on the right, the West Bank. And I was living in a town, in a village in the West Bank, and the photographs and stories from this presentation uh, were taken from the West Bank. So, as I said, these are known as the Occupied Palestinian Territories, Occupied, what does that word mean, right? Well, the, the purpose of my presentation is to tell you about this occupation. And the first part of my talk is just explaining the structures of the occupation. What is it composed of? I'll be talking about restricted movement, checkpoints and roadblocks. I'll be talking about settlements and outposts. I'll be talking about the wall. And I'll be talking about imprisonment. And once we have sort of a general understanding about what the system itself looks like, I'll be talking about how are people reacting? How are people resisting? And the next part of my talk then will be about resistance. I'll be talking about everyday nonviolent resistance. I'll be talking in particular about demonstrations. And I have a section as well on Israeli activism. So to get started with restricted movement. In the Palestinian territories, there are both Palestinians and Israelis living there, but they use different roads. There are Palestinian roads. There are Israeli roads. Palestinian roads tend to be older, often uh, even unusable, like the one you see in this photograph. Israeli roads tend to be more modern, constructed by the Israeli government for Israeli citizens living in these territories. And they might be sort of four-lane highways, like the one you see in this photograph. Uh, Palestinians are not allowed to use the Israeli roads unless they're able to obtain a kind of permit, in which case they might be able to use, say, a certain section of a certain road, but in all other cases, the roads are segregated. Palestinians and Israelis use different colored license plates. 
Palestinian cars have green or white colored plates, meanwhile Israeli cars have yellow colored plates. And this is so it's easy to see from afar whether a vehicle is carrying Palestinians or Israelis. And it also makes it easier for the soldiers who are manning the area to monitor who is using which road. So for example, here you can see an army jeep pulling over all green or white plated vehicles to the side of a road, meanwhile all yellow plated vehicles are allowed to pass by unhindered on the left. And this is called a checkpoint. And checkpoints are a major institution in the occupation. Uh, they are essentially barriers manned by soldiers or border police that are used to control Palestinian pedestrian or vehicular movement. And the idea behind a checkpoint is more or less what you might experience like at a border crossing where you go, you stand in line, you show your ID, you answer a couple of questions, maybe open up your bag. One of the main differences with checkpoints in the Palestinian territories, as you can see from this map of the permanent checkpoints installed in the West Bank, those little blue things, is that the vast majority of these checkpoints are not located around the border of the West Bank, but actually the vast majority of them are located internally within the Palestinian territories, namely most of them between Palestinian towns and villages. And what this means for a Palestinian person who's living, let's say, just south of Hebron, in the south of the West Bank, who wants to travel I don't know, 30 miles north to the city of Bethlehem, which is a little bit uh, more towards Jerusalem. So, 30 miles. Uh, that should take a person under normal circumstances like 30, 40 minutes, maybe an hour tops. Well, it's very likely to take that Palestinian person anywhere from two hours to four hours to eight hours to maybe even an entire day to travel just those 30 miles because of the number of times that he or she would be stopped along the way at these checkpoints. And well, this is obviously very frustrating. You know, people are spending hour after hour, day after day at these checkpoints to get from any one place to another. But beyond just being sort of a, a frustration, these checkpoints are extremely disabling to Palestinian daily life, to all aspects of Palestinian daily life. For example, these checkpoints make it very difficult for a Palestinian person to hold a steady job. It's never clear if it's going to take you 10 minutes or 3 hours to commute from your little village to the nearest city. Uh, similarly, attending classes on a regular basis is pretty much impossible. Um, unless you happen to have a university in your little village, higher education is basically out of the question. So beyond just being sort of an annoyance or a burden, these checkpoints are preventing Palestinians from earning a living and from getting an education. Beyond that, you know, getting to a, a marriage, a funeral, uh, graduation, um, going to visit your family, you know, all aspects of daily life are affected. And I don't know, imagine if, if you, every time you wanted to go uh, to work or to school or to church uh, or wherever else you were going, that you had to go through a series of checkpoints that held you up for two, three hours. How would that affect your life? And maybe that gives you sort of a, a glimpse of how disabling these checkpoints have become to Palestinians just sort of on a daily basis. This is the checkpoint outside of the city of Nablus. It's called Huwara. And we were there doing checkpoint watch, where we basically document what's happening at these checkpoints. And on this day, the rule was the following. Uh, women were allowed through the checkpoint. Older men were allowed through the checkpoint. And young boys were also allowed through the checkpoint. But any men between the ages of 15 and 40 weren't. Period. It didn't matter where you were coming from, it didn't matter where you were going, it didn't matter who you were, it didn't matter if it was an emergency. If you were Palestinian male, 15 to 40 years of age, you couldn't get home or to work or to school or to the hospital or wherever you were going. And so they gathered here literally hundreds of Palestinian men in this ditch next to the checkpoint in hopes that the rule would change at some point. And at one point I saw two of them go off to the side with trash bags frantically trying to fill them up and I asked them, why are you suddenly picking up trash? And they told me that the soldiers had actually given them the trash bags and told them that if they were able to fill up their trash bags with trash, then that they would be allowed through the checkpoint. Health violations are another major issue at these checkpoints and in the occupation in general. Here you can see a Palestinian green and white plated ambulance that's pulling over to the side of a road to allow a yellow plated Israeli vehicle privilege, priority, 
on that road. And these ambulances will sometimes wait for hours before reaching the checkpoints themselves. And when they get there, they're oftentimes not sort of rushed, rushed through quickly, but actually held at gunpoint, as you can see in this photograph, while another soldier will go around the back to sort of screen through the back of the ambulance. And the reasoning given for holding up ambulances oftentimes even longer than average civilian vehicles is that apparently in the past these ambulances have been used to transport uh, weapons, or people wanted by the Israeli government. Um, and, well, I've done a little research on the subject and discovered that actually there is one documented case of a Palestinian ambulance being abused for these purposes. But even if they were being used for these purposes, even if that was the case, remember that this Palestinian ambulance is traveling from a Palestinian village to a Palestinian city. It's not traveling from the West Bank into Israel, and that is where these checkpoints are located between Palestinian built-up areas, such that in what way is holding up this ambulance endangering the lives of the people in back of it? In what way is this contributing to the safety or the security of the Israeli population, let alone the entire Palestinian population? This is the checkpoint outside of the village of Deir Balut, where I spent some time, and this checkpoint is open from 7 in the morning until 7 at night. What that means is that if you have any kind of an emergency between the hours of 7 p.m. and 7 a.m., well, you're kind of out of luck. And in fact, what happened was that a woman from the village who was seven months pregnant with twins began to have contractions at 1 o'clock in the morning. Her husband drove her frantically to the checkpoint, which they needed to cross to reach the nearest hospital in the city of Ramallah an hour away. They got to the checkpoint, and the soldiers who sleep above it came down to meet them and were very polite, and they said, look, uh, the rule is very clear. Palestinians are not allowed through until 7 in the morning. Please come back at 7. Well, uh, the woman obviously couldn't wait six hours to have her babies, and so they argued, argued a bit more, and the soldiers, again, they were very polite and even apologetic, and they just kept saying the same thing over and over again. They said, look, we didn't make the rules. We don't even agree with them. We're just following orders. We're just following orders. This is something I hear from soldiers almost daily. Uh, we're just following orders, and that's exactly what the soldiers were doing. At that point, the husband decided to call an ambulance to come from Ramallah City an hour away uh, to the checkpoint so that all it would take would be for his wife to walk by foot from her own vehicle across the checkpoint to the ambulance. Ambulance arrives an hour later, and the soldiers come down shaking their heads and they say, look, it doesn't matter if you're going by foot or by car, you're still Palestinian, it's still the middle of the night, you still can't cross. At that point, they're sort of tearing their hair out, and the husband decides to call all of his friends, and he, like many Palestinians, had actually worked in Israel, speaks Hebrew, and was able to contact an Israeli friend that had a connection to the army that was high enough such that they were able to get this woman permission to cross the checkpoint um, and to get to the hospital. The soldiers allowed her through. They wouldn't allow her husband to go with her. She got to the ambulance and, and immediately began to give birth to the twins. And the twins were born, both of them alive and basically healthy, except, of course, that they were two months premature. And because they were premature, they were in desperate need of hospital attention. And because they were an hour away on a bumpy road in the middle of the night, having waited almost two hours at the checkpoint, they weren't able to reach the hospital in time. And because of this, both of this woman's babies died. And I tell this story not because it's heartbreaking and not because I'm trying to demonize these soldiers. Look, I believe in the Nuremberg Principles, that people are responsible for their actions even if they are following orders. That said, what I think is the greatest crime of all is not so much the acts of the individual soldiers who might be nicer or meaner, but the, but the system itself, the fact that things are structured this way such that there are even soldiers there to begin with who control whether or not a person can go to the hospital. That, to me, is the greatest crime. Like I said, this is the checkpoint outside of the village of Deir Balut. The village itself is sort of over to the left of the photograph, um, and there is a direct road from the village to the checkpoint, but villagers aren't allowed to use it. And that's because there's something called roadblocks on it. And roadblocks are, like you see here, often concrete cubes placed on Palestinian roads to prevent Palestinians from being able to use their vehicles on their roads. So what these roadblocks mean, for example, for the village of Deir Balut, is that instead of taking a half-mile paved road from their village to the checkpoint every morning on their way to work or to school, they have to take a three-mile unpaved detour all the way around 
or the countryside to reach the exact same spot. What does this mean for them? More time, more stress, more wear and tear on their vehicles, more money for gas. And again, this question of security, right? These institutions, the checkpoints, the roadblocks are supposed to be there for the security and safety of the Israeli population to prevent terrorism. In what way are these roadblocks securing anybody, you know, forcing Palestinians to take this long detour? How much is this about security and how much is this about control? Some roadblocks are made with dirt, and you can see these villagers on the right here are coming home from work. They live on the other side of the roadblocks, so what they have to do every morning is that they drive their cars to the roadblocks, park them, walk around by foot, and take a taxi the rest of the way to work or to school and repeat the process coming home. So these roadblocks prevent something as basic as Palestinians taking their vehicles from their house to their work or to, to school. And finally, these roadblocks are extremely disabling to the Palestinian economy. As you can imagine, transporting goods from one end of the land to the other is not a trivial process given all of these checkpoints and roadblocks. So basically, a truck that's carrying Palestinian goods when it reaches a roadblock has to sort of uh, turn around and back up against the roadblocks, get an another vehicle to come from the other end and turn around and back up from that end, and somebody has to actually manually transport these goods from one end of the road block to the other, um, as you see in these photographs. And, well, the products are not always office equipment. They could be uh, produce, perishables, things that go bad by the time they reach their destination. And they could be desperately needed medical supplies. Beyond just taking a long time, this whole process renders a lot of these Palestinian products much more expensive than they otherwise would be because of the extra manpower and vehicular power that's required to transport them. What, ha what happens then is that a lot of these Palestinian products end up being even more expensive than their Israeli counterparts, which are very easy to, to transport on the Israeli-only roads. What happens then, of course, is that the Palestinian market is then flooded with Israeli products, which Palestinians, many of them struggling to make ends meet, end up purchasing instead of supporting their own economy, supporting the very country that is occupying them. Settlements are the next part of my talk. Settlements in the territories are essentially communities of Jewish Israelis who are living on Palestinian land. And they may be sort of villages, towns, cities. Here's a rather large one um, near Bethlehem in Jerusalem. And again, all of this land here is Palestinian land. It belongs to the Palestinians. It's internationally recognized as Palestinian land. And yet there's this city that's been built on top of it that is exclusively for Jewish Israelis. Well, what does this mean? You know, who gets to live in that city? Well, I could live in that city, right? Because I'm Jewish. I would just have to fill out an application. I could move there next week if I wanted to. And yet the, the farmers, the Palestinians that own the land that the city was built on, aren't allowed to live in it. Now, this process is nothing new. It's happened throughout history, all over the world. And there's a name for it. It's called colonization. And it's interesting that in English and in Hebrew we have this kind of benign word, uh, you know, settlements, whereas in many languages, like French, for example, these settlements are called colonies, and that's exactly what they are. And they are illegal, according to international law, which prohibits an occupying power from transferring citizens from its own territory to the occupied territory, which is exactly what Israel's doing. Instead of working against the system, though, Israel actually promotes it, as you can see in this photograph, which shows a building board on an Israeli-only road in the Palestinian territories, and it basically says, it's in Hebrew, it says, now more than ever, and underneath it says, basically, if you come to our community, to Ariel, which is a settlement, if you come to live in Ariel, you will be rewarded with 100,000 Israeli shekels. That's more than 20,000 U.S. dollars. In other words, the Israeli government is actually paying its own citizens to move from Israel proper to the occupied territories to become part of the illegal occupying population. And what's particularly interesting to me about this billboard is who is it targeting? You know, who are going to be the Israelis who uproot their families to go live on this foreign land because it's cheaper to do so? Is it going to be well-off, you know, wealthy, established Israeli families? No, they want to live in Tel Aviv. 
The families who end up taking advantage of these offers are going to be low-income Israelis, poor Israelis, recent immigrants from Africa, from Eastern Europe. And in fact, a lot of these settlements, Ariel included, are populated primarily by immigrants who've moved to the territories, not because they say this land is ours and nobody else's, but because they're looking for a higher standard of living. And these financial offers can be very appealing. Uh, people who take advantage of them will get nice housing oftentimes, with mortgages subsidized by the government. Uh, there are parks for their kids to play in, strip malls, swimming pools, and a place where water is so precious. Uh, a nice offer, right? Again, all of this built illegally on Palestinian land. At this point, there are settlements all over the West Bank. The red dots in this map indicate where you have an illegal Jewish-only colony built on Palestinian land. And, of course, coming along with the settlements and colonies is the road network. And here you can see it's just a handful of them, but the way those blue roads and highways really chop up, compartmentalize that Palestinian landscape. Remember, of course, that these roads were built illegally on Palestinian land, and that the Palestinians owning the land that they were built on, for the most part, aren't even allowed to use them because of the segregated road system. The next part of my talk is on outposts, which are similar to settlements in that they are incidents of Jewish Israelis living illegally on Palestinian land. One of the main differences are the people who choose to live in these outposts. So I talked before about what I call economic settlers moving to the territories for financial benefits, and they represent about 80% of the settler population, a vast majority that says, according to polls, that they would be willing to leave if they were offered financial compensation. So when Israel says it's impossible to make all of these hundreds of thousands of settlers leave, remember that the vast majority are there simply because the government is paying them to do so. The remaining 20% of the settler population are often called ideological settlers, moving to the territories not for money, but because of their beliefs. And many of them believe that the land in the West Bank and Gaza belongs to the Jewish people for oftentimes religious reasons or maybe political reasons. And according to many of these people, uh, the Palestinians are the ones who are occupying this land, Jewish land. And so they will actually come in the middle of the night with trailers and simply establish themselves on a plot of Palestinian land and say, we're not leaving. You know, this land belongs to us. Well, a farmer wakes up the next morning and there's an outpost on his land, and uh, while the Israeli government says that it doesn't condone this kind of practice, it doesn't do a whole lot to prevent the settlers uh, from coming or to make them leave. And so over time, these outposts begin to grow. More settlers move into them, eventually they want a school for their children, uh, they want a fence around them for security, uh, they want a road to connect them to Israel, and over time what you have is it's no longer an outpost. It's a new settlement, and that's the way a lot of these settlements were originally founded and grew into what they are today. Um, and once they become settlements and recognized by the Israeli government as such, they become subsidized by the Israeli government, which means subsidized by the U.S. government, by us. The U.S. government gives Israel between three and five billion American tax dollars every year. That's more than ten million dollars every single day that is going towards upholding uh, these illegal practices. And, you know, this may seem like something kind of on the other side of the world has nothing to do with us as Americans, but we are the ones paying for this. You know, we have a right, we have a responsibility to know where our tax dollars are going and to ensure that they are not being used to violate human rights, international law, and even U.S. law. Here's a few pictures of outposts. This one is above uh, the village of Yanun, and oftentimes they're placed on hilltops um, for sort of strategic reasons. Here's the village of Yanun, a, a Palestinian village of about 300 people. Um, here's one of the homes in the village, and again, you can see up top there the outpost. Um, and as I mentioned before, a lot of the settlers living in these outposts don't really think the Palestinians have any right to be where they are. And so they'll actually come down with large weapons even to try and threaten the villagers, to try to make them leave their homes and land. And 
Here's a picture of one of these armed settlers that's come down to threaten um, a, a villager picking her olives. In the past, these settlers have beaten up numerous villagers. They've poked a young boy's eye out of his face. They've beaten an old woman with her walking stick. They've killed a villager. Uh, they've stolen olives. Uh, keep in mind, of course, that Palestinians in this part of the world are not allowed to have any kind of weapons. Now, clearly, some Palestinians do manage to get weapons. We hear about it in the media, but the vast majority of Palestinians don't. They don't have anything to defend themselves with besides stones or, or their bodies. Meanwhile, uh, Israeli soldiers and civilians, these settlers, are oftentimes carrying around these large weapons. So that's the kind of balance of power that you feel going into the territories. The settlers have burned the village generator so that the Yanun villages didn't have any more electricity. And this is the Yanun water source where settlers have come down, they've urinated in the water source, they've poisoned it with dead chickens, anything to try to make the villagers leave. And at the end of 2002, uh, the village of Yanun came together to make a decision about this issue. And what they decided was that they were going to leave. They decided to abandon their ancestral homes and land because they felt so threatened by the settler presence. And one day they picked up and left all 300 of them. Well, the international and Israeli peace communities heard about what had happened in Yanun and went to the villagers staying in a nearby town with an offer. And what we said was, uh, if you choose to return to your homes and your land, we will commit to maintaining a constant presence of international and Israeli peace activists to live with you in your community for as long as you want us there. Uh, we will bear witness to these crimes. We will document them, try to get them into the media. We will stand beside you in solidarity should those settlers attack. And about a third of the villagers accepted our offer and have come back to their homes, almost up 100 of them. And living along with them now are these international and Israeli peace activists. And this is a picture of one of those activists. His name's David. He's a friend of mine. And David was actually the victim of a particularly brutal settler attack in which he was beaten to a pulp in his face, which shows that the settlers will attack not only Palestinians, but internationals and Israelis who are there in solidarity with those farmers. Um, but David continues to do wonderful work in the Palestinian territories. Uh, he's recovering, and he is a citizen of Israel, um, a Jewish Israeli, and one of many Israeli activists that I've had the privilege to work with in Palestine. Now, it's very important for people to distinguish between what it means to be Jewish, someone from the Jewish religion or culture, like myself, uh, what it means to be Israeli, a citizen of the state of Israel, and what it means to be a Zionist someone who supports the idea of an exclusively Jewish state. These are three separate categories. There is some overlap, but they are not the same thing. It's very important to distinguish. There are Jewish people who are not Israeli, like myself. There are Israelis who are not Jewish. 20% of the Israeli population is Palestinian. There are Jews who are not Zionists. There are Zionists who are not Jewish. The increasingly influential Christian Zionist movement in this country and it's very dangerous when these ideas become conflated because people start associating them as equal such that people are afraid of standing up against what Israel's doing because they're afraid that would make them an, an anti-Semite or a Nazi or something. And it's, it's absurd. It's crazy. You know, occupation and oppression have nothing to do with Judaism. And to criticize these things is not anti-Semitic. So it's important to keep these things separate in our minds. Here you can see a Jewish Israeli, a rabbi from a group called Rabbis for Human Rights, planting an olive tree alongside a Palestinian farmer. Here you can see an Israeli activist protesting the policies of her government alongside Palestinian colleagues in the resistance. In Israel, all Jewish men and women are required to serve in the military, but there have been thousands of Israelis that have stood up and said, we refuse to take part in this institution, and they're known as the Refuseniks. Um, and I have to say that in Israel, there's a much higher 
tolerance for debate and dissent on this issue than you find in the United States. In Israeli newspapers, you'll find much more candid descriptions of the occupation than in U.S. mainstream newspapers, where sometimes it's even taboo to use the word occupation. Um, but in Israel, actually, the majority of the people are opposed to the settlements and opposed to the occupation as it is right now. So a lot of times, people in the United States feel like they have to support the Israeli government in order to support the Jewish people or the Israeli people. Um, and they don't realize that, just like in the United States, there are Americans that don't always support um, what part of their government may do. Um, there are there are Israeli citizens that don't support the Israeli government. And, and actually, uh, a, a very telling statistic shows that, um, that it is five times more likely for an Israeli soldier to commit suicide than to be killed in a terrorist attack. And so when people talk about this occupation as, as helping the Jewish people, um, they don't realize uh, how many Israelis are actually against it and how important it is for the Jewish people as well as the Palestinian people to end this. Refuseniks often uh, suffer from uh, discrimination within their own communities. I've known refuseniks that have been ostracized by their communities, even disinherited by their families, refuseniks that have gone to jail for what they believe, um, and refuseniks are ineligible for a number of jobs in Israel. So there's a whole slew of institutions built up to prevent Israelis from speaking out against what their government is doing. Uh, and yet they continue. Here is a Palestinian farmer picking olives with an Israeli activist in the olive harvest. I'd like to bring us back to the main outline. We've talked about restricted movement, we've talked about settlements and outposts, and down at the bottom there we've talked about Israeli activism. And I'd like to begin now talking about the wall before getting into imprisonment and, of course, resistance. So, the wall. This is a picture of the wall that Israel's building. Uh, that's me and a friend standing in front of it. And this is what it looks like in urban areas. It's 25 foot concrete. And uh, oftentimes in the newspapers you'll find it's not called a wall, instead they call it a security fence. Um, and a, a lot of people really believe that this is a security means, it's to prevent terrorism. And I've talked to people who say, well, look, you know, it's very sad to have a wall and everything, but we've been fighting for so long, you know, and all we want is peace. And maybe if we just stick up a wall between the two sides, they'll stop fighting each other, they'll stop killing each other. Well, this is an interesting question, right? Does separation, does segregation bring peace? Also interesting is that a lot of the people that support the wall, it turns out, if you ask them, may not have ever actually seen a map of where the wall is being built. And this is really critical to understanding the intention behind and what the effects are actually going to be of this wall. Uh, so, you know, if you were going to build a wall between your house and your neighbor's house, where would you build it? along the property line, right? Or maybe a little bit on your territory. Well, take a look at where Israel is building this wall. In this map, you can see the border around the West Bank, and then you can see those red lines that indicate where Israel is constructing this wall. As you can see, over 80% of it doesn't even touch the green line, that border of the West Bank, but actually snakes in, in effect annexing all of that land on the western side onto the Israeli side. Um, in particular, take a look at the Jerusalem area, where most of the land is being taken. And remember, of course, that Jerusalem is a holy city not only for Jewish people, but also for Muslims and for Christians. 20% of the Palestinian population is Christian. And they, along with their Muslim counterparts, are being separated from the religious center of their land, as well as the economic center of their land and the geographic center of their land. Uh, the entire eastern third of the West Bank was going to be cut off with the wall. And now, instead of building a wall, they've decided to line that eastern third with checkpoints so that Palestinians, for the most part, can't even access that part um, of the West Bank. So what's happened is that it's been chopped up, the West Bank has been chopped up into little sections. And here is a series of four maps that really show over time what has happened. And I think that they really tell the story well. The first map um, is, uh, represents, uh, with the green, the amount of land that was owned by Palestinians in 1946. And that's 92% of the land, whereas Jews owned 8% of the land. 
Uh, then in 1947, the UN Resolution 181 offered Jews 54% of the land and Palestinians 46% of the land. By the end of the 1948 war, when Israel was declared a state, um, the, the Jewish Zionist forces had actually acquired 78% of the land, leaving the Palestinians with 22% of the land in, in the West Bank and Gaza. And finally now, in 2006, you can see um, what that land has come to, um, a series of, of smaller sort of enclaves and islands. Here you can see the, the region that I was living in and the way that Palestinian territory has been sort of chopped up and compartmentalized by that wall. In particular, um, at the top left is, is the city of Kalkilia a city of more than 50,000 Palestinians that has been completely surrounded by this 25-foot concrete wall, such that its outskirts uh, look something like this now. This is, these are the sniper towers, razor wire, and concrete wall around the Kalkilia city, also known as the Kalkilia ghetto now, or an open-air prison even. And very interesting um, is that uh, as a person of privilege in this part of the world, as an American, as a Jewish person, as a white person, I was actually able to see this wall from both sides of it. So here are photographs of the Kalkilia wall from the city of Kalkilia, the Palestinian side. Meanwhile, the next photograph I'm going to show you is a picture of this exact same wall from the Israeli highway that passes by on the other side of it. And I think this is very interesting. They've sort of built up on a slant up to the wall where they plant flowers in the springtime, um, such that it doesn't even look like a wall. And as I said before, many Israelis are much better informed about the situation than American Jews or Americans in general in this country. Um, and yet at some point, I actually think that most Israelis probably don't even know what the wall looks like. Uh, where it's being built, what it's doing to Palestinian farmers and families. And this, to me, is almost a kind of censorship, preventing that message from getting across. And of course, censorship is something happening in our country as well. Here's a little anecdote. A friend of mine um, was flying back from Palestine to the United States, and she had a layover in Germany along the way where she picked up this issue of International Newsweek because it had a particularly sympathetic article about the plight of the Palestinians. You can see at the top there. Um, and then she had another layover in Chicago on her flight home where she found this. Uh, also Newsweek, August 2004, but the U.S. version, with almost the same information, but one major difference. That article about the plight of the Palestinians had been completely removed from the entire magazine and replaced by one about the Olympics. And, um, well, some people will, will tell you that's just because Americans don't care about the Middle East, but... You know, look at the cover story. Of course Americans care about the Middle East. Uh, we read about what's happening in Iraq. We read about uh, what's happened in Lebanon. This is a kind of censorship, and it's happening all over the place. We need to be aware of it. It's very dangerous, of course, because the very people who are paying for what's happening don't know what's happening. Um, and so, you know, you don't have to take my word for it. I tell people, do your own research. You know, I didn't believe it when I first heard it. I did my own research, and that's what I recommend for other people to do. Now, another kind of censorship is just also in the wording. So, for example, instead of calling it a wall, calling it a fence. And, well, to be fair, in rural parts of Palestine, the wall looks like this. At its base is wire fence. But if you look a little bit closer, you'd find that this Fence is not the kind of fence that you'd have like in your backyard kind of fence. Much of it is reinforced with heavy-duty electric wire and almost everywhere with razor wire. Back to the concrete areas. This is Abu Dis, a neighborhood of East Jerusalem. And what I want to illustrate here is that when you have a Palestinian built-up area and an Israeli settlement in the Palestinian territories, the wall won't be built, first of all, along the actual border, or even right in between the Palestinian town or village and the nearest settlement, or even sort of right up against the settlement to just get it onto the Israeli side. But oftentimes, in my experience, they'll build the wall as close as possible to the Palestinian built-up area, so that not only the settlement, but all the land between the settlement and the nearest Palestinian town or village also ends up on the Israeli side. And this land, you know, it's not just 
pretty land to have a picnic on once in a while. This land is usually the land that, that farmers and families in surrounding areas have been living off of for generations or even hundreds of years. This is their livelihoods that's being taken away from them. Uh, one of the things I do with IWPS is actually accompanying farmers to their land that has now been stranded on the other side of the wall or checkpoints. Um, and Israel says that although it's cutting off farmers from their land, it will allow them through at certain times with a certain kind of permit. Um, well, this is a man that I accompanied um, to, the, to the gate of the, of the wall in hopes of getting to his land. Um, and he had gone to, to acquire one of these permits to get to his own land. Um, and he actually had papers as well dating back to the Ottoman era proving that he was the owner of that land on the other side that he could see through but he couldn't get to when he wanted to. Um, well, we went together and we waited for two days trying to flag down any jeep that would pass by hoping that soldiers would let us pass and they wouldn't. Um, and this man, he, he didn't even want to go to pick his olives. He just wanted to go to be on his land. He said, I just want to sit under my trees, uh, and he couldn't. So another thing that people are cut off from is each other. Um, so sometimes if you have a house on the outskirts of a village, because they build the wall right up against the village, that house will end up on the wrong side of the wall. And that's exactly what happened to my friend M Munira, who lives in this house. In front of it, you can see that 25-foot concrete wall separating Munira and her husband and their six children from their village, from their community. Uh, behind the house is another wall separating the family from the nearest settlement. And on the right and left sides of the house are two more fences separating the family from their own land, land that has been annexed by Israel. Uh, so Munira and her family are basically living in a kind of cage. Here's the gate to the cage. Um, you can see it's manned by soldiers, so people who want to visit Munira, whom you can see in the back with one of her kids, uh, have to sort of hope that the soldiers are in a good mood and will let them through. Um, Munira at this point hardly dares to leave her cage because she and her husband have been served something called demolition papers, which means that the Israeli army actually intends to demolish their home. Um, and many people actually consider Munira sort of lucky because oftentimes if a house is in the way of an expanding settlement or road um, or the wall, they won't bother building a whole fence around it and, and uh, getting a soldier to come man it, but they'll actually bulldoze that house. Um, and so Munira is actually afraid to leave her house for fear that she could come back and it would be gone, not that they wouldn't bulldoze a house with people there, which they've done in the past as well. Um, but anyway, here's a picture of the family. That's Munira on the left, her husband Hani on the right, and one of their six children. Well, Hani and his family actually originally came to Masa, the village where he lives with Munira, in 1948 as refugees of the 1948 war. Uh, the majority of the people living on the land that the UN designated for a Jewish state in 1947, the majority of the people living there were not Jewish. And Zionist forces actually expelled 750,000 Palestinians from their homes to surrounding areas in the West Bank and Gaza and in the diaspora. And Hani and his family, for example, were homeless for 10 years before they were able to finally save up enough money to buy themselves some land and build themselves a home. Uh, Hani says that he built this home with his own hands for his family. So just to keep things in perspective, um, what this demolition order, what this wall, what this occupation, what these things are doing are threatening to make Hani and families like his refugees for the second time in recent history. Keep in mind that 60% of the Palestinians living in the West Bank and Gaza are already refugees, having lost almost everything already. So keep that in mind when you hear people say things like, Palestinians just aren't willing to compromise. And I don't know about you, but looking at this family and, and all the Palestinians I worked with during my time in Palestine, what I kept thinking was just, how long can people live like this? You know, how long can people endure this kind of a system before rising up, standing up for their rights, resisting? Well, of course, the answer is that Palestinians are and have been resisting for a very long time. We hear about one kind of resistance, violent resistance, suicide bombers that kill innocent Israelis. 
Um, and people are always asking me, you know, Anna, why are Palestinians always resisting with bombs? Why are they always strapping bombs to themselves, trying to kill as many Israelis as possible? Why don't they use nonviolent resistance, like Martin Luther King talked about, like Gandhi talked about? Where are those things happening? Well, the answer is that Palestinians are and have been using non-violent resistance, not just once in a while, not just here and there, but literally almost every second of almost every single day of their lives. Just think about it for a moment. Think about Munira and her family. Simply staying in their home. Simply saying, look, you've taken our land, you've taken our freedom, but you will not take our home is a kind of resistance, and it is nonviolent. This is nonviolent resistance. Think about the villagers of Yanun who've come back to their homes and their land. Uh, they know that they could be beaten up, they know that they could even be killed by the settlers, but they also know that it is their right to be in their homes on their land, and they're coming back to defend that right. This is nonviolent resistance. And in my opinion, any attempt on the part of Palestinians to maintain any kind of, of normalcy or dignity in their daily lives in spite of this occupation is a kind of resistance to that system. It's just not something you ever hear about in the newspapers and media. And here's a couple other examples of everyday nonviolent resistance in Palestine. Here's a group of women from the Tokarm region who've been cut off from their trees by the wall. They've lost their livelihoods, so they've formed an embroidery cooperative to sell embroidery to support themselves and their families. Instead of giving up, instead of leaving, this is nonviolent resistance. This is the village of Atawani, where settlers have actually boiled barley seeds in rat poison and spread that poison around the landscape of Atawani to try and dissuade shepherds from bringing their sheep to their land for fear that the sheep will eat the poison and be killed. Um, and while well, I talked to the shepherd, and, um, and she knew about the poison, but she also knew that if she doesn't come back to her land, uh, then, then the settlers would have gotten exactly what they wanted, and over time, they would have come and confiscated the land, saying, well, nobody else was using it. So she's coming back to defend her right to be on her land, even if she might lose a sheep or two. This is nonviolent resistance. Painting the wall. Nonviolent resistance. Climbing the wall is nonviolent resistance. Here is a young boy who's building his own roadblock out of rocks and wire that he found in his village. And he told me, Anna, I'm going to build a roadblock so that the jeeps can't raid my village tonight. This is nonviolent resistance. And finally, demonstrations are a kind of resistance happening almost daily in Palestine. We just don't hear very much about them, where communities of Palestinians will, will march down to the land that is being threatened. Um, here you can see a farmer trying to explain to the soldiers uh, that have been placed there to basically protect the bulldozers that are uprooting the trees. He's trying to explain to them that the trees being uprooted belong to him and his family and have for generations. Uh, this is something else you might see to demonstration, Palestinians who've come together to pray on their land. Um, and I, I find it particularly moving given that for many of these Palestinians, this could be their last chance to ever be on their land. And they're choosing to spend these final moments together as a community in silence, in worship on their land. Now, although most of these demonstrations are primarily peaceful, um, they are often met with a great deal of violence from the soldiers um, who throw tear gas or sound bombs. There are sometimes rubber bullets or even live ammunition used against nonviolent demonstrators. There is also sometimes violence from the Palestinian side. Here you can see a picture of a Palestinian boy who's picked up a stone and is throwing it at Israeli soldiers and jeeps at a demonstration. Uh, and I include it not because stone throwing has anything to do with my work with IWPS, it doesn't, um, but first of all because it is the reality. There are stones thrown at these demonstrations. And, and second of all, to give it a little bit of perspective. 
Uh, so the stone throwing that you see here is used as the justification for the mass imprisonment of young Palestinian men who are put in jail for throwing these stones. And, uh, well, I would agree that a stone is definitely a weapon, right? You know, you can kill somebody with a stone, no question about it, but we don't get much sort of context in which these stones are actually thrown. So, for example, this boy, he hasn't sort of gathered up a bunch of stones and snuck across the, the border into Israel to stone as many Israelis as possible because he hates Jews. This boy is in his village, and he's watching jeeps and bulldozers surround his village, uproot his trees, and build a wall around his community. And he's picking up a stone and throwing it at those jeeps, at those bulldozers. And I guess I would just ask you, you know, if someone were to come into your home and start carrying out your television, and then your stereo, and then your computer, at one point, would you pick up a lamp and throw it at them? You know, it's not about justifying, it's about being realistic. What would you expect of yourself in that situation, and how does it compare to what you expect of the Palestinians in the situation they're in right now with the wall? Like I said, many of these kids end up in jail. Here are five kids from the village of Marda, near where I lived, and a jeep um, was, was raiding their village one night, and they threw stones at the jeep. No, no soldiers were hurt. In fact, very few soldiers have actually been hurt by these stones because they're usually thrown from very far away for fear of being arrested. And in fact, these five kids were picked up for stone throwing and put into jail for six months. More than 340 Palestinian children and 9,500 adult Palestinian political prisoners are being held in Israeli prisons today. More than 10% of these are what are called administrative detainees, which means that they can be held without charge indefinitely. And I was once walking in Ramallah where I found a silent procession of people holding photographs of their loved ones being held in Israeli prisons. They asked me to show them to the people of America, so that's what I'm doing. About 40% of the entire adult Palestinian male population in the occupied territories has been detained in Israeli detention. Torture and humiliation are, are systematic, according to Amnesty International. And I guess what I find so uh, incredible is that in spite of the systematic imprisonment of Palestinians involved in violent and nonviolent resistance, in spite of the checkpoints and the roadblocks and the settlements and the outposts and the wall and the land confiscation, in spite of all of these things that Palestinians continue to resist, continue to stand up for their rights. And the finale of my presentation is a slideshow of photographs that I and my colleagues took at demonstrations that I think sort of illustrates uh, what I see as the incredible resilience and strength that remains with the Palestinian people. It is really this resilience and strength that gives me hope for the future, and that's why I'd like to share it with you now. Thank you.